I've been well, thank you. I'm trying to. Especially with my butt back there. Oh, yeah. He's staring at you. Staring at me. <laughs> Good morning. My name is Deborah Grigsby-Smith, and I'm the Public Information Officer for Centennial Airport. At this time, uh, if we could go ahead and have everyone from the media go ahead and take your place. We'll get the official program started. Uh, just a little bit of housekeeping. Once the uh, presentation is over, some guidelines on how we'll be conducting questions and answers. Uh, those individuals from the media who are here in person will take those live questions first and then Kaylee Fisher from the Division of Fire Prevention and Control will handle and moderate all of the virtual questions. So with that in mind, again, welcome to Centennial Airport. Well, good morning. Uh, my name is Robert Oleslagers. I'm the Executive Director, uh, Chief, Financial, uh, Chief Executive Officer at Centennial Airport. On behalf of the Arapaho County Public Airport Authority, I'd like to welcome you to Centennial Airport. This is uh, uh, the kickoff for the uh, uh, Wildland uh, Fire Pre uh, Prevention and Control uh, kickoff. Um, uh, last year we were not able to meet here, but this year we are. Um, last year was a record year for fires, and uh, actually if I may make a plug for the uh, Wings Over the Rockies Air and Space Museum, they're going to be honoring the men and women uh, on April 22nd uh, with a uh, virtual gala for the work that they did last year, but also previous years and years to come. Uh, now it's my honor to introduce our governor, uh, Governor Jared Polis, to be the next speaker. Thank you. Governor? Thank you, Director Oleslager, and good afternoon, everyone. I want to thank our state emergency support response leaders and agencies, uh, Colorado Department of Public Safety Executive Director Stan Hilke is with us, Colorado Division of Fire Prevention and Control Chief Mike Morgan, uh, from the County Sheriff's, from Eastern Colorado, Logan County Sheriff Brett Powell, Colorado State Fire Chief's President uh, David Delvicio, from Canyon City, uh, U.S. Forest Service Deputy Regional Forester uh, Jackie Buchanan and Bureau of Land Management Acting Associate State Director Stephanie Connell. Uh, they all joined me in a briefing uh, just prior to this uh, where we went over uh, the plan here in Colorado and where we are. Colorado is, is as you know, experienced uh, challenging and tragic fire season last year. Uh, hundreds of thousands of acres, uh, three largest fires in the history of Colorado, loss of at least two lives. Uh, the top three fires, um, you know, in one year is, is uh, simply breathtaking. In 2021, we are, have already experienced fires. Uh, one of the things that uh, is a change of paradigm is Colorado used to talk about a fire season. It's now a year-round phenomena, right? I mean, here we are going into our essentially our monsoon season, our wettest season. There are already fire incidents across our state. And you might recall last year's fire stretched well uh, into the late fall and winter months. Um, a large wildfire has major impact on Colorado. Um, it affects the land that we love, where we work and play. It affects the air quality for residents across the state uh, and those on, who rely on our water supply and watershed protection. Uh, that's why we're taking many uh, steps to have a more proactive approach to battling wildfires in Colorado because these trends and the drought are not anomalies. They're really a harbinger of the future. Uh, with climate change and significantly increased population, both overall, including utilization uh, of our wild areas, and also in the, uh, the, the, the wildland interface where more people live. 
Uh, just last month in March, I signed Senate Bill 113, the Firefighting Aircraft Wildfire Management Response Bill. It enables Colorado to purchase a new Firehawk helicopter that will quickly respond and put fires out before they rage out of control. The state is also enhancing training using new technology, uh, including satellite and drone, public information campaigns, bolstering the fight against wildfire danger. We are really taking this proactive preparation to a new scale to address the, the new risks and the greater risks of wildfire, to address the operational demands on our firefighting teams, to ensure that both our professional and volunteer fighter, fighters have the tools they need from the start to be effective and to be safe. A strong aerial response supports the efforts of the professional and volunteer firefighters on the ground and the people that work around the clock in the emergency operations centers. Wildlife fire protection responsibilities on non-federal lands in Colorado follow a hierarchy of local jurisdiction. First the county sheriff, finally to the state, led by the Division of Fire Prevention and Control. Of course, substantial parts of our state are federal land. And the three uh, large fires last year, one was predominantly BLM land, two were predominantly U.S. Forest Service, uh, Department of Agriculture land, and we work closely with our federal partners who are also here with us today uh, around protecting our treasured uh, federal lands from wildfires. Uh, we need to give our first responders that are in the line of fire every defense they can to help keep themselves safe, to save lives, to save property. And I'm proud that Colorado is one of the top states in the nation for getting the resources we need as soon as they are available. And with the additional investments we have made and are making, we will do even better. Fire is a concern for our entire community. Whether you live near a potential fire or you're not, we're all impacted by air quality. Uh, we're all impacted uh, by the challenge to our community. We have a shared responsibility to keep one another safe. And the number of people at risk of wildfires in Colorado will continue to increase. Approximately 2.9 million people live in Colorado's wildland urban interface, and that has increased from 2 million just five years ago, increase of a third in, two, in five years, and that will only continue to increase. The uh, state demographer estimates that in the next uh, 19 years, our population will grow from about 5.7 million to 8.5 million people, and that means more people, both on the wildland interface as well as residents of uh, cities and areas where people will use the outdoors and increase traffic in outdoor areas. And let's be clear, well, not all wildfire, well, not, well, let me be clear, why, while not all wildfires are caused by humans, the majority of wildfires are caused by humans. It can be dragging a trailer chain that can cause a spark. It can be failing to put out a campfire. It can be casting a cigarette or cigar aside. Uh, and I encourage everyone to do our part, be careful, be cautious this fire season. Uh, a seemingly minor act can cause great devastation in our state. Be responsible, be careful. Trailer chains, uh, cigarettes and cigars, put out your campfires, fireworks. Uh, take every precaution necessary uh, to avoid a tragic event. And we expect dry conditions to make fire season especially challenging. Uh, <clears throat> the true nature of this fire season won't be apparent until we see the April and May precipitation, and this forecast will be updated on a regular basis. We have the initial forecast here for you today. But this coming month, May, is Wildfire Awareness Month in the state of Colorado. All month long, there's an online campaign to inform and educate Coloradans about wildfire risk, the steps that each and every one of us can take to reduce that risk. It's a focus of the partnership between the Colorado State Forest Service, the Colorado Division of Fire Prevention and Control, U.S. Forest Service, Rocky Mountain Region, and the governor. And I want everyone to get involved and do their part to prevent fire wildfires in their communities. We know that Coloradans will continue to take every fire safety precaution to protect all of our natural resources, our federal lands, our, our state parks, perimeter defense around private residences that live in the wildfire interface. And it's important to know that these precious natural resources are not only uh, what we know and love about the Colorado way of life, they also are critical to attract millions of tourists from across the country every year, supporting hundreds of thousands of jobs in the state of Colorado. And as we work to vaccinate all Coloradans age 16 and up and, and when approved, um, 12 to 15, and build back our Colorado we love, it's important to continue to be careful. Our outdoor areas have been 
a sanctuary for us during this pandemic. State park visitation is up. Uh, so many Coloradans have enjoyed time in the great outdoors in a safe way where it's easy to practice social distancing. Uh, as more and more Coloradans get the vaccine, I think they're going to continue to go back to the wild areas that many of them rediscovered in this last year. With that, I'd like to turn it over to the Colorado Department of Public Safety Executive Director, Stan Hilke. Thank you, Governor. I appreciate that. My name is Stan Hilke, Executive Director of the Department of Public Safety. I want to start off first by just thanking the Governor and the Colorado General Assembly for the support that they have given to the issue of wildland fire this year. Uh, it has been remarkable to see the amount of uh, effort and support that is, that is coming towards the wildland fire problem in Colorado. Um, from excess funds to make sure that we have the funds that go to initial attack, to aviation support, to supporting, uh, prepositioning uh, people around the state in strategic ways. Uh, all of that is making a huge difference. At the same time, in the seven years that almost that I have been here in state government and then 12 years previously as elected sheriff, I've never seen a more state of readiness than we have today. And I, I just want to say thank you to everybody that has been a part of this. We just had an incredible briefing upstairs and all the partners talked about their readiness and they're, they're uh, ready to go for this year. Um, the, the, everything from uh, mutual aid to working with the state fire chiefs, the surge that they gave us in 2020 um, to protect towns like Estes Park when the East Troublesome Fire was coming through from uh, Rocky Mountain National Park demonstrated that we are actually in the middle of a metamorphosis of the change of the culture of how we respond to wildland fire in a very, very good way. And uh, we all want to capitalize on that energy and continue to make improvements in this area. I also want to say that that this is not just a suppression issue, it's also a mitigation issue. Mitigation and suppression are symbiotic in this world and we have to continue to do both to try to make a difference long term for Colorado. Um, in, the, in the Department of Public Safety, uh, safety is always a priority for everything that we do. We want to also make sure that our firefighters and those people that are responding are, are safe, that our citizens are safe, and that we do the very best job that we can to protect life and property in Colorado. It also is important though, and the governor touched upon this, that we need the help of the citizens of Colorado to make this happen right. The people that live and work in great state need to be prepared and proactive as well. The public plays a valuable role in preventing wildland fires. On average, across the country, human-caused wildfires make up 87% of wildfire occurrences every year. Most of these fires can be prevented. We want people to take extra precautions before venturing out and be careful with anything that, the, that can cause a fire. The governor mentioned it, chains dragging on the ground, cigarettes, uh, chainsaws, fireworks, any uh, welding, all of these things might be very necessary tools for the the day-to-day -day, day -day activities of people, but you also have to be very aware of the devastation that one small thing can cause. Take extra steps. Get set up now to receive safety information. Sign up for local emergency alerts. Follow local fire and emergency services on social media. Make sure that you're ready. Research how you will stay informed when traveling and when recreating. Research how you will be able to exit those areas should a wildfire occur. When fires do occur, we want you to also please be aware and respect local public safety area closures and follow the guidelines that are given to you by the experts in our state. Our motto at the Colorado Department of Public Safety is being safer together. Together, we can reduce the danger to lives and property caused by wildland fire in Colorado. And now I'd like to introduce to you Chief Mike Morgan from the Division of Fire Prevention and Control. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Director Hilke. Um, I, I too want to thank um, our, our, our legislature, our governor. I've, I've never seen the leadership um, and, the, and the support that we're seeing um, in supporting the problem, the wildfire problem in Colorado. I also want to thank our partners. I've never seen it be more collaborative. Our partners with the Forest Service, our partners with emergency management, county sheriffs, state fire chiefs, the Bureau of Land Management, all of the National Park Service. Everybody is coming together in ways I've never seen before and it's a, it's a good feeling to be a part of that. 
as Director Hilke kind of alluded to, we, we all have to be collaborative in doing this, and that means that the people that live, work, and play in Colorado, you have a part to play in this as well. And I won't repeat the things that the governor said or Director Hilke said, but please do your part and pay attention, have situational awareness about where you are, what you're doing to keep a fire from getting started to begin with. As has been mentioned, historically wildfire seasons in Colorado were a four month period of time, typically that college students like to come out and fight fire and have a pretty good job. Since 19, the 1970s, our fire seasons have expanded and they're over 78 days longer. Um, we're having fire years, not fire seasons anymore. We had multiple fires in, in February and in March. We've got our equipment out helping support local fire departments and sheriffs as I speak to you here today. As we all know, Colorado experienced one of the worst fire seasons in history in 2020, driven by a multitude of factors, including unseasonable warm conditions, lack of moisture, overabundance of fine fuels, and increased recreational traffic across the state. Cameron Peak Fire was considered to be one of the Colorado's worst fires in history. It destroyed and damaged 469 structures, of which 224 were residences. Consider this as we speak to you here today. 20 of the largest fires in Colorado's history have occurred since 2000. Four of the five largest fires in Colorado's history have happened in the last three years. I also want to point out that 15, 15 of the state's 20 largest fires have occurred since 2012. We all have to do our part. The extreme drought conditions, hazardous fuel accumulations, and hot dry conditions create fast moving large scale fires. DFPC is developing a strategy with our partners to be prepared for longer and more destructive wildland fires by, sh by shifting our resources to a model that allows us to respond more effectively to Colorado's growing wildfire seasons. The 2021 Wildfire Pre Preparedness Plan outlines a holistic, comprehensive approach to wildfire management that includes suppression and response, fuels and forest management, and mitigation of all types. The plan is based on lessons learned from the 2020 fire year, as well as the fire years of past. It also implements two new tools and capacities as a result of recommendations of the Colorado Fire Commission and support from the governor's office and the state legislature. As the, as the state's lead fire agency, the Division of Fire Prevention and Control will coordinate with local, county, state, and federal partners to leverage all available resources to increase response capacity and effectiveness. Following one of the worst fire seasons our state has ever seen, coupled with a trend of increasing wildfire occurrence and impacts, it is, a, it is critical to increase the state's capacity to respond to these incidents. The governor's proposed budget included a substantial investment in both wildfire mitigation and suppression. It takes both. Recognizing that it will likely take a holistic approach to reduce the significant impacts to life, property, and the environment caused by large destructive wildfires. Senate Bill 21-113, signed by Governor Polis on March 21, authorizes the pur purchase of a Sikorsky Firehawk S-70I helicopter capable of performing both firefighting and non-fire missions, a wonderful tool in our toolbox. Not only will the Firehawk be an additional resource for aggressive and early initial attack, but it can also be used on longer duration wildfires. The signing of Senate Bill 2149 increases the number of days existing DFPC seats and helicopters that you see here today are available um, to help support local governments in their efforts to keep fires small. To the forecast, our current long-range forecasts indicate that we'll, we will experience above average temperatures and below average precipitation through June, which will result in a continuation of drought conditions across the state and the emergence of above average significant fire potential over the portions of southeast Colorado. The long-range warm and dry projections suggest that a normal start to core fire season during the second half of May across all of southern Colorado. Continuation of the warm and dry conditions is anticipated to intensify drought conditions earlier than normal 
resulting in an above average large fire potential expanding northward through the month of June and effect affecting the majority of the western slope by July. Our success in fighting fires can be credited to our partnership with local, state, and federal agency, most of which are here today. Pardon me. We are calling on all of you that live, work, and play in Colorado to help reduce the impact of fires by being vigilant, respecting fire restrictions when they are in place, and doing your part to protect your property from wildfire. We're all in this together. Be aware when you go to different parts of the state of the conditions that they're experiencing, and please pay close attention. Check with your local fire agencies, your lo local federal agencies, the county sheriffs to see if any restrictions are in place. With that, thank you for your time. Yeah. Um, thank you for the question. Um, I, I think one of the main things we've learned over the last couple of years, and, and I will describe it this way, that, that we are looking at the fire problem with all of our partners, looking at it as, as a duration versus impact. And, and by that I mean the longer a fire burns, the greater the impact is. That means impact of fire suppression costs, it means risk to, to health and safety, uh, loss of life, property, uh, water, um, watershed destruction, recovery costs. The longer these events occur, the greater that is. What we have learned in the past, and especially as the governor mentioned, when we get more into the wildland urban interface and that growth in the wildland urban interface problem we have in Colorado, and the properties that we protect as a state agency, that mostly means we have a lot of values at risk, homes. So our, our, our approach, our new approach with the resources that the governor and the legislature are supporting um, and the Colorado Fire Commission have pointed out is aggressive initial attack is what we should be doing on threatening fires. What that means is we're trying to provide more resources to the local fire chiefs and the local sheriffs to keep fires from getting, getting large. We spend a little bit more money today, but we don't have as many long duration events as a result of that. 2020 was a horrible fire season for us with over 600,000 acres burned in the state of Colorado. But we also had a lot of very, very uh, significant wins by initiating aggressive initial attack. Chatfield 2 fire, for example, just south of here, um, where, where we were able to, we spent about $300,000 the first day in aviation, but the fire went out. Um, the uh, Elephant Butte fire in, um, up in Evergreen. If there, if Evergreen is not a place we want to have fire on the landscape. There's too many homes up there. But we were able to do aggressive initial attack, and we've proven the effective on this. San Miguel County, El Paso County, Mesa County, I could go on and on about places we saw success, which, which showed the legislature and the governor and through their leadership and support, additional resources in the form of Firehawk helicopter, extending the, the contracts on our single um, engine air tankers, and on our Type 2 exclusive use column, um, um, helicopters as well, which again we brought on early this year and they've been fighting fire already this week. So, um, great question. So, so what we've got um, happening is Senate Bill 113 was, was spoken to. Senate Bill 113 purchases a, a Firehawk helicopter. We will not see that helicopter um, until actually probably June of 2022. In addition to that, Senate Bill 113 gave us an additional $3 million for this year to contract for a Type 1 helicopter. So we will have a Type 1 helicopter in our fleet this year. Um, that is going through procurement right now, I just spoke with uh, Vince Wellbaum, our, our aviation unit chief, this morning about that. Uh, that process is in place. We anticipate having that Type 1 helicopter ready to go uh, probably the end of May, first part of June. In addition, Senate Bill 49 um, provides an, an, an 
I may have to phone a friend here if I miss something here, but one of the things that does is it provides us money. Oh, I should back up. The other thing in 113 that it does, it provides us expanded use of what we call the Wildfire Emergency Response Fund, which gives us more latitude to take resources and pre-position them around the state. We, we have a preparedness level system. Most people know that the federal government has a preparedness level system. We've implemented one in the state of Colorado. We've divided the state into four different quadrants or districts. And then we can, we have the ability through this now, we can pre-position resources when we see weather events or, or things that are happening. Actually, eastern central Colorado today is under red flag warning. So we're pre-positioning resources in anticipation of, of the likelihood of a fire. Um, Senate Bill, back to Senate Bill 49, the enhanced state assistance, there's $1.8 million in that fund um, that ex allows us to provide additional aviation support, um, crews, the engines, moving those around um, to, in order to support local governments to try to keep fires fall small. Senate Bill 49 also expanded the uh, single engine air tanker to my right. Um, those are normally, our contracts have been 150 days. We have two exclusive use contracts on those. Uh, those are normally 150 day contracts um, through Senate Bill 49 and, and the governor's um, package. Um, it expands the two of those to 240 day um, contracts on those assets. Uh, so both of those are on now. Uh, the type two helicopters that I spoke to exclusive use, we have two of those. We were able to bring those on as well from uh, what were 120 day contracts. Those are now 230 day contracts on both of those. Um, it also provided us some additional equipment for prescribed fire, some additional radios, some additional work we can do to help support our state and federal partners um, on wildfire mitigation projects as well. Uh, oh, yes, thank you. Thanks. Uh, Chief Jones, our, that was my phone a friend, so thanks, Chief Jones. Uh, it also, uh, Senate Bill 49 gives us last year, uh, was the first year that the state of Colorado brought on a large air tanker. Uh, it's a P3 aircraft for larger uh, um, larger uh, quantity water drops. Um, it's another tool in the toolbox, works really well in higher elevation as well as with heavier canopy fires. Last year was the first time we brought those in to where we had an exclusive use. It's under our operational control. We're not competing with all, all the other western states on where these things go. Um, so that, um, Senate Bill 49 gave us that asset on an ongoing basis for, a, we have a 110 day contract for that coming again probably starting late May um, or the first part of June. We're going to continue as the governor said, we're going to continue to monitor. Um, we, we have long-term forecasts that are taking us into July that are looking pretty rough. We're hoping that we will, being an optimist, I'm hoping that we're, our monsoons will come in, as the governor mentioned, in April and May and bring that forecast down. But we'll continue to monitor that and keep everybody posted. Great question and absolutely, I'm glad you asked that because one of the other things through our partnerships we were just speaking of this morning, um, we, we, first of all, we send closest available resource, okay? So, so um, in, in that enhanced assistance um, fund that we have, um, we don't send, if, if a local fire chief, if Chief Del Vecchio from Canyon City calls and says, I need a single engine air tanker or a helicopter, we don't say we can only send the state helicopter or, or seat. We send the closest one to him, and then we coordinate that with our federal partners. So all of these assets, the, the federal assets and our assets, are used seamlessly about sending it the closest available resource for that aggressive initial attack. Now, historically, um, there's a lot of mutual aid agreements, but, but a lot of the aviation assets were not part of that mutual aid agreement. However, we're proud to say for the first time, we're super excited to say, that we've signed agreements with our federal partners where all of the aviation assets will be part of that mutual aid system um, to get that attack, you know, those threatening fires, to get them under control as quick as we can.
Well, I, I think what you're talking about here might be something different than wildfires. You might be talking more about uh, urban fires. None of the wildfires we're talking about here were started because of building malfunctions. When it comes to buildings in the wildland interface, the key strategy, construction, yes, but the even more important strategy for the 300,000 homes is, um, is perimeter defense and taking down uh, trees uh, and other um, fuel that is near the house. And it's just remarkable when you visit some of these burnt areas, and I've visited a number of them, where you see, you know, three houses, two that are totaled and they didn't do the perimeter defense, and one that was effectively, you know, passed over by the fire where they did the proper to perimeter defense. I do strongly support additional resources to help private landowners conduct successful perimeter defense in the wildfire interface. Yeah. Yeah, it's several different moving parts. Uh, we can follow up with my office and we'll, we'll get you that, that summary. I would add there's another important one that occurred, and that was the voter approval of Proposition B uh, that, that doesn't so much affect the state part as the fire district part. And I thought Chief Delvecchio could speak briefly about that. Good morning, I'm Dave Delvecchio, the fire chief of the Canyon City Fire District, also the president of the Colorado State Fire Chiefs. Um, Proposition B was vitally important to the fire service agencies in this state. Colorado Fire Chiefs represents about 400 fire departments across the state, and that equates to about 14,000 firefighters. Uh, as Director Morgan had spoken earlier, you know, that initial fast, aggressive initial attack primarily is usually performed by those 14,000 firefighters. Uh, the Proposition B, which was the Gallagher Amendment, the repeal of the Gallagher Amendment, um, had some profound impact on uh, fire departments across the state, especially special districts. And most of those districts rely on property taxes, as most of you might know. Uh, with the Gallagher Amendment in place, there was a lot of uh, anxiety over where that fire district would be in the following year based on property tax valuations and what have you, um, which in effect adversely affected the capabilities to respond to these wildfires. Um, my district, for example, was looking at a 20% reduction in paid firefighting staff several years ago because of the Gallagher Amendment. So as you look at that across the, across the state, that repeal of the Gallagher Amendment um, was quite beneficial to the fire service in this state and the continued uh, control of the way that was property taxes and what have you are uh, maintained across the, the years to come will be vitally important as well to maintain the firefighting forces that we have in this state to provide for not only wildfire events but any natural or man-made disaster that we do respond to as a fire service agency. So, so w what we're seeing right now, of course, like today, um, the, out on the plains of Colorado, we, we've got uh, red flag conditions, which means conditions are right out there. Obviously, Colorado is very diverse in elevation, fuel types, et cetera, et cetera. So we have different parts of the states that'll be, that'll be doing different things at different time. And that's, again, where that ability to move the limited resources that are available around, that's what, what that's all about. Um, so we're, we're experiencing some stuff on the plains now, which is a seasonal normal, if you will, other than we're seeing high winds and higher temperatures, lower humidities than we'd like to see or what we'd normally see. What we see is the southern part of the state, particularly southeast, well, actually the whole southern part of the state, we will start seeing that going into above normal conditions, um, going into late May and into June. And with the, the quicker runoff, um, and the higher temperatures that we're, we're anticipating, um, we will see that continue to push north, um, and it will kind of wrap, if you will, to the north up the western half of the state. Um, we're still kind of waiting to see the juries out, if you will, to see what happens with the monsoonal moistures in the front range portions of the state. Right now, those are looking um, better, if you will, um, but, but we're to, to kind of put, maybe put it in perspective, we, 
we're looking at very similar to what we were this time of year as we were last year. So we're seeing similar types of uh, framing to look at for a 2021 fire season to look a lot like a 2020, other than the front range is looking a little better than it did at that point in time. That, that is a great question. Actually, Director Lester is here. I, I want to, I'm going to say a little plug before I go in. One of the things I failed to mention, and I apologize to, to Director Lester when I was here, is Senate Bill 54, which was also the governor supported bill, which provides money for mitigation. The, the governor's office and the legislator have, have, take, have taken a very intent and purposeful and, and the correct approach to saying you can't fund without the other. You have, you have to do both mitigation and suppression. You know, so, so the mitigation projects, and Director Lester can kind of speak to, those are the larger fuels, the smaller fine fuels, or, or the, the, the grassy fuels um, that, that are, are typically handled in a different way. Uh, but I'll let uh, Director Lester speak to that if he's thrown, throw them to the wolves here. Thank you, Mike. Um, so we have a, uh, a fund called the Healthy Forest Vibrant Communities Fund, and in that there's a revolving business loan fund, and that's been provided in the past to uh, help businesses have loans, have capital to get them started. Capital's tough. Um, uh, the uh, uh, biochar plant in Gypsum, uh, biomass, excuse me, biomass plant in Gypsum, took them a long time to find that funding. But there, there's an acknowledgement that that will be an important aspect of it, and there's also some discussions on, is that business loan fund large enough? But that's, that's yet to be determined. But that, that is part of the Healthy Forest Vibrant Community Act. And as, as Mike mentioned, we, the governor added and the legislature added another $6 million to our, our forest restoration, wildfire risk mitigation grants, which is a huge help going forward. Okay, um, the, the wildfire, the, for, I'll start with the Firehawk helicopter. That's a one-time purchase of about $24 million. Um, there is about $3 million um, in, and I'm speaking to 113 first, there's about $3 million um, to, uh, to uh, contract for a Type 1 helicopter for the 2021 fire season. And there's about uh, $3.8 million in startup costs for staffing to bring the folks and all the other resources to come together to, for the state to have a Type 1 helicopter for it to be effective. Okay, Senate Bill 49. Um, it's five five point three million, I believe, for the large air tanker um, for the, the contract for that. The extension of the contracts for the single engine air tankers. Uh, again, the, the, each one of these air single engine air tankers costs us approximately one point three or one point four million per year under the new extended contracts. So it's about six hundred thousand dollars in in. Uh, money to extend those contracts. Uh, Vaughn, do you remember the Type 2 helicopters? Of two? Or maybe Melissa did. I think it's, it's 1.2 million, 1.5. We can get that for you guys some additional detail. But it's about a million and a half for the Type 2 helicopters to extend those contracts uh, from the, the 120 to the uh, 230 that we have on that. So, and then the enhanced state assistance, 1.8 million that goes to that. Round numbers, okay, there's a lot of one-time costs, but for ongoing costs, there will be a, a, a change in our budget at approximately 15 million annually, um, contributed to our ability to fight fires early on. Now, I know, again, that sounds like a lot, it's a lot of money, right? We, it is a lot of money. But when you look at the 285 million we spent on fires between the, the federal and, and state, not speaking to what local governments spent, um, investing some money up front is, is saving money in the long run. Okay. 
So, so we did a lot of preparedness work around COVID-19 last year with all of our federal partners. It's very interagency across all of the Western United States and how we plan and how we work and how we do business. Um, all of those plans to address COVID-19, we learned a lot of lessons, and, and I, I dare to say we got good at a lot of things. We learned a lot of efficiencies, but we're anticipating, you know, of course, the, um, you know, the vaccinations are out, as the governor was mentioning, and, and, and the firefighters are, are in that 1B class, so most firefighters should be vaccinated. But we're also anticipating um, to, to be very well prepared to implement whatever lessons that we learned in 2020 related to COVID. There were some efficiencies there, as well as any social distancing practices around people that, that have not been vaccinated by their own choice. And I believe um, that's all the time we have for questions other than um, Kaylee told me that we had a couple virtual questions um, to answer as well. Well, there's very strong protocols in place just to make sure that there's uh, no issues with the vaccine and, and there weren't any issues with the vaccine and the vaccines are continuing today. Um, a couple people, uh, you know, had some orange juice afterwards. Uh, maybe they were dehydrated or uh, scared of needles, whatever it was, but no issue with the vaccine. They're continuing. Everybody who was canceled was rescheduled for this weekend. And, uh, you know, again, we always take uh, a very extreme precautions at these. So whenever, you know, there's any dizziness or any anything, they're going to uh, wait to make sure that everything's okay and the all clear is there and everything's fine. We're going to take some online questions now. The first is for the governor. De Noticias Univision, Gobernador, ¿Puede decirnos cuál será el plan para prevenir los incendios y evitar lo sucedido el año pasado? Governor. Este año compramos un helicóptero especial para luchar contra los incendios. Es, este helicóptero puede responder muy pronto a incendios y, y uh, lucharlos a um, con muchos ganos. También tenemos algunos prestos en nuestros bomberos y uh, el, uh, uh, las personas quien uh, luchan contra uh, los incendios. Um, ahora vamos a tener más uh, capacidad para responder pronto y decisivo. Our next question is what fire mitigation strategies will be implemented this summer and how are those changing from past years? Uh, currently, we, I mentioned the addition to the uh, Forest Restoration Wildfire Risk Mitigation Grants and uh, those are being, uh, those are being uh, announced now. And so we look at some of those projects to be able to hit the ground probably by midsummer. And that will work on forest health issues. Uh, we're working with landowner associations, counties, local government to try to improve those, those issues. Uh, we are looking at and working with our federal partners, trying to determine what values we're trying to protect. And we're going to try to move a lot of our mitigation efforts to those, those areas, whether it be for water supply or for community protection. So there are plans in place to <clears throat> move forward on those. And we are really trying to focus our mitigation efforts. So we're not having a mitigation effort here and then 40 miles away another mitigation effort. We're trying to link those so that we do protect those values. And I think that focus is it's not new, but it's certainly taking a, uh, a bigger share of our attention going forward. So we're, we're pretty confident that we're going to be making more impact going forward with the mitigation work. Right, and last question. Would this more aggressive approach the state is implementing have changed any of the outcomes of last summer's fires, or are we at the mercy of Mother Nature and or climate change? Um, I think that the short answer to that is yes, um, as I kind of alluded to earlier. Um, we, th through the, um, th the Enhanced State Assistance Program, and, and we did a lot of this through, the, uh, through an executive order that the governor did um, last year to allow us to be more aggressive with our Enhanced State Assistance, um, we, we had 16 state responsibility fires in 2020. Um, 
That said, there was a, over 5,000 fires that occurred, wildfires that occurred in the state of Colorado in, in 2020. I believe about 5,300 fires that occurred. Um, so, so we did a really good job, a really effective job, the locals did, at keeping fires small, the lion's share of those, and then the sheriffs coming in to help support those, and then us coming in to help support the locals and the sheriffs. We kept, if it was 5,300 fires, we kept 5,284 of them from getting big. Right, so we did a good job. As I mentioned earlier, um, you know there was some very specific examples. I'll, I'll say, you know, Elephant Butte, where where we had a fire that there was over a thousand homes impacted on that in a, in a part of the nation. That, that nobody, it makes the hair stand up on the back of your neck when you hear that there's a fire in Evergreen, Colorado. Um, and so our, our ability to work with our federal partners and everybody to do this enhanced state assistance um, and be more aggressive, and, and I failed to mention earlier, to, to my left here is what we call a, the, the multi-mission aircraft. These were, we, these were purchased by the state in 2015. And if you, if you get a chance to look at this afterwards, this particular aircraft, we have two of these, um, is provided for, to us, we, we were purchased these for, in, for early detection of fires. These aircraft in 2018 found 95 fires nobody knew about. So we find these fires, 95 of them last year, over 400 of them um, since the program was in, it started in late 2015, where we find fires through technology in the camera balls that are underneath these things. We find them, we find the Latin long of what they are. Um, we give that to our, the local jurisdiction, whether that be a local fire department or one of our federal partners. They dispatch resources out there and the fire is put out. It never gets a name, it doesn't make the news. And those are the ones we're trying to, that's what we're trying to do. Um, you can go to our website, um, a DFPC, you can find a lot of information on this. You can see the videos of the technology and what that's doing. These are the only two aircraft in the United States of America, and, and Colorado is leading the nation as it comes to that. I believe CAL FIRE is now in the, uh, working on purchasing their first similar type of aircraft because it's proven itself. In addition, we have other partnerships with the Colorado National Guard for other methods of early detection. We want to we want to find fires when they're small. Small, um, and we want to be aggressive with how we how we attack those to keep them small, because the and, and I think you maybe perhaps one of the questions earlier about you know what are we doing you know, we we talk about they talk a lot about prescribed fire and controlled burns and these other types of, of scenarios, those are all weather and drought condition con dependent. Um, and so, as I just told you in, in our forecast, we don't anticipate that the conditions, the weather conditions, the drought conditions, all of those things are going to be favorable to a, do a lot of fire on the landscape type of efforts for mitigation efforts. Now, when those opportunities arise, we will partner with our, all of our partners to take advantage of that, but we're not forecasting that to be a great year for us to, to implement those strategies. So. Okay, I believe, am I done, Kaylee? Thank you all so much. That's the end of the press conference. Thank Folks you. back here are going to hang around, so if you wanted to go up and ask them questions. Um, and for those that streamed with us virtually, thank you so much. My contact information, I'm the PIO at DFPC. It can be found at dfpc.colorado.gov. Thank you all.